Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Anybody remembered back in the early 80s, 1982 was the year where a lot of films that came out during the summer. Yeah, who wouldn't forget? But, you know, like Tron and Rocky Free and all the rest. There was a film that was directed by one of the famous directors of all time who gave us films like Duel, The Sugarland Express, Jaws, and Close Encounters of the Fur Kind as well as 1941 and then all the rest that follows. There was a film that pretty much became a cultural phenomenon. It also became one of the highest grossing films of all time and it actually met well with, with with thousands of critics worldwide because they never got tired of, of, of one of the most overhyped productions of all time. And who couldn't forget, it became one of my childhood favorites as well as everybody else. The sci-fi family adventure called E.T. The Extraterrestrial. Yep, it was so popular back in December of 1982 that they started releasing so many merchandising all the way around. Yep, every, everywhere at stores you get to see nothing but E.T. collectibles. Yep, including the infamous video game that was released by Atari 2600. You know, which started the whole video game crash. Well, anyway, it's ev they were everywhere. Books, magazines, and toys, action figures, cereals, you name it. T-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just couldn't get enough of it. Yeah. Well, anyway, and I still think E.T. is one of the best films of all time. And I always enjoy it, even uh, as a kid. And I never get tired. And no with so many multiple viewings, it just never gets old. I mean, who could have... I mean... It, it's also... Um, it also had a wonderful score by Star Wars composer John Williams. You know, which is a movie about... You know, an alien creature who came to a suburban town where he befriends a young boy named Elliot. And they all became, you know, they all became best of friends, and, which apparently E.T. was trying to discover his communication by uh, finding his family, which is already up and out of space. Still, it's one of the best movies ever made. But back in 1988, it took us six years to finally get yet another film that sort of in the same league as E.T. to come up with something this blanted and just <laughs> completely cynical all the way around and that turns out to be the film called Mac and Me which Mac stands for Mysterious Alien Creature yep this was a film in which distributor Orion Pictures decided to come up with something that try to match its success with E.T. the Extraterrestrial by adding a lot of product placement for McDonald's as well as Coca-Cola, Skittles, Sears, oh, you name it. Yeah, it's, it's just one of those biggest uh, promotions that they really have to offer. Because um, I remember seeing the trailer for the film when I went to go see Short Circuit 2 um, back in 1988, during the summer. Yeah, I, yeah, I saw that at the URF Plaza, I think, I believe. And I remember seeing the trailer where they showed Ronald McDonald reading the script book for the new movie, Mac and Me, only to to see if, if maybe Ronald McDonald was going to make an appearance in the film, like it was going to be his film. Well, that kind of went over it because I only got to see Ronald McDonald only in the dance sequence. Yeah, when they went into McDonald's birthday party. 
Yeah. And he was only there for like a, a few. S he was only there for like a couple seconds. What a waste. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's it's very unpleasant to sit through, and it just pisses me off because it really insults my intelligence. Because as much as I love E.T. the Extraterrestrial, this movie just pisses me off even more because. For one thing, it had beautiful cinematography. It had an awesome score by Alan Silvestri. Yeah, the same composer who composes uh, the scores for Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and many other films that he's been doing for years. And he winds up doing this piece of crap. Maybe. Yeah. No kidding. Well. I had to get for what I paid for, so here it goes. The movie stars Christine Appensall, as we speak, from Saturday Night Live, went on to do other films, as we already know. Jonathan Ward, who later went on to do the film Ferngelly as the voice of Zack. Jake Caligori, Katrina Kasperi, Lauren Stanley, Martin West, Danny Cooksey. Yeah, who's been best known for the role as Bobby Budnick in Salute Your Shorts. He had a short role in, at the beginning of the film, though, as Jack Jr. Yeah, and he's always been best known for the role as Sam in Different Strokes, as well as the voice of Montana Max in Tiny to the Ventures. Squire Frito, who definitely played, as we speak, Ronald McDonald as himself. With cameo appearances, mostly extra appearances that are uncredited, and you're gonna love this: Jennifer Aniston, Nikki Cox, and Dominic Lucero from Roundhouse. You wouldn't believe it, but it's true. They're all in this movie, and it's directed by Stuart Redfield, who's also the, the co-writer of the film along with Steve Feek. Oh, yeah. Well, let's get right to this um, godforsaken mess. The movie begins set in an unknown planet, which I believe it might be Mars. A NASA spacecraft has landed and begun to take rocks and soul samples. Four aliens have discovered the spacecraft, including the youngest alien creature named Mac, also known as Mysterious Alien Creature, had been suckered up through its vacuum and made its way back to Earth. While they're at the military base, they actually had escape using their powers that they can destroy or heal anything that they touch. And once the youngest alien, the Mac, hides into a passing band, which is occupied by a little boy in the wheelchair named Eric Cruz, along with his older brother Michael and their single mother Janet, all played by Jake Caligari, Jonathan Ward, and Christine Appensall. They actually had moved from Illinois to California trying to find a suburban home that they're about to live. And once they move in, they're, they're just ready to unpack everything up with all the moving guys helping out. Way Eric started spotting something very mysterious that started to crawl around you know, once he moves in such as turning on the TV set, which they were playing the cartoon Snorks, and that's what he begins to notice. And then suddenly the shower went on, you know, spotting all these footprints everywhere, including the scene where he actually drills in, you know, the holes in the wall, you know, adding all these, uh, <laughs> all these, he started decorating the whole entire living room, including the deer and everything. All the way around. Oh boy. And unfortunately, yeah, he gets blamed by Eric's family. Yeah, that's right. Blame the little boy in a wheelchair for doing all of this. Makes no fucking sense. Well, once uh, Eric finally went outside, and yeah, he already, of course, yeah, met uh, the girl next door named Debbie, who's played by, by Lauren Stanley. He started hearing some uh, wolf whistles 
um, once uh, he was outside. And suddenly his wheelchair was starting to go out of control once he started to, to go straight down to the hill. And you're going to love this scene because this is the scene that became very infamous that's, that's being played on the Conan O'Brien show on TBS with Paul Rudd uh, as a guest. Yeah, talking about that famous scene where his wheelchair was going way out of control. He's already going down straight to the hill and he tries to stop it but he breaks the the stick you know, where, which it stops the brakes and suddenly he falls in. You're gonna love this because there's actually I believe they might have added a dummy inside that wheelchair just to fall all the way down into the lake. They actually shot this in slow motion you know, prior to that. Oh man, that, that scene must have been a classic. And it's no wonder. Well, Mac finally showed up and suddenly winds up saving Eric from, from that because he couldn't swim. Already uh, Debbie had spotted him along with Eric's family to see if he's okay. So he's already so Mac had saved his life and then all of a sudden, you know, the very next day, you know, Janet was very nervous because she's already having, you know, her, her very first day working at Sears, you know, having a job interview. Michael was already on the wheel, which apparently you're gonna love this already. Um when when he when Michael hits the brakes on, on the band, once you spotted that blue car which which a girl actually told him, Hey, watch the road, you idiot! I believe that might be you're gonna believe this. Jennifer Aniston. That's right. Jennifer Aniston from Friends. In that particular scene. And yeah, she has an extra in the movie, so you wouldn't believe it. Later that night Eric has decided to set a trap by using all these drinking straws and pour in a cup of of Coke. Yeah, Coca-Cola is is a real <laughs> is a real cheese here because instead of using those Reese's pieces, you're gonna see nothing but drinking straws and all this other stuff and, and cups of Coca-Cola because it seems like this is you know this is Max cure you know to to be more refreshing and everything. Okay, well, apparently Eric and, and his friend Debbie decided to, who already had sold the alien earlier, had sucked the alien into the vacuum cleaner, which suddenly malfunctions and causes the entire neighborhood to suffer a power surge. Now that's where Debbie was started to wear it as a proton pack, like Ghostbusters, and she's already moving out of control <laughs> all the way around, and and around and around and <laughs> back all the way you know, in circles and in a flying loop everywhere you know it was going out of control until until suddenly you know <laughs> he's finally released after all of this Michael finally believes Eric about his story of meeting that creature but leaves before the mother has been convinced um, Eric's behavior had towards the alien has changed after it fix all the damages that causes to the house. Leave behind several newspaper clippings with Eric believing to attempt to communicate. Yeah, they even communicated by doing this. Yeah. And whistling. Yeah, I can't whistle that much, but... You get the idea. Yeah, by using a Wix furniture ad and the pictures of horses. Anyway, um, then the FBI agents Wicked and Zimmerman, you know, not to be related to all these other crap that happened, who they have been around when the four aliens had escaped from the base, decided to track down Mac to the crew's residence as they'd been recognized by Eric and Michael. Eric has forced to take the alien, you know, to the birthday party at the McDonald's restaurant which Debbie's older sister Courtney had worked but unfortunately the only way to do that is is to have uh, Mac in a disguise as a teddy bear yeah that's right so there was a famous scene in the movie where they actually had a dance sequence inside and outside of McDonald's 
Yeah, we're, we're apparently you spotted as we speak. Ronna McDonald making an appearance uh, for only a couple seconds. Yeah. And, yep, and it was possibly the most awkward dance se sequence I've ever seen in a McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, going to McDonald's is one thing, because I remember going to see Ronald McDonald in person, you know, back when I was only a little kid, have a party over there. Yeah, well, this one is, is very awkward compared to what I've been experiencing. Wicked and Zimmerman, along with the, the entire crew, decided to follow Eric and Mac all the way around through the streets. Yeah, lots of cars crashing by until all of a sudden they went straight to Sears where Janet works, you know, trying to escape from all of them and, you know, just <laughs> while well, Max decided to use, um, you know, his powers to, to control all these uh, remote control cars, trying to distract all of them so they won't, won't go after them. Well, they all try to escape all over around until, you know, until Michael. Courtney and Debbie, you know, in the band, you know, trying to go after Eric and and Mac um, inside so they can find, so they can go all the way to to Palmdale, to where, where Wicks Furniture is located, to find Mac's family inside an abandoned mine. Once uh, they found their family, they, they stop at a gas station where they accidentally alert security. And then suddenly they went straight to a supermarket where all of a sudden, you know, the father had stolen the gun from the security guard. And the police had arrived as an untended shootout that takes place all the way straight to the parking lot. And it also follows a huge explosion, which apparently Eric had been caught in the crossfire and already was killed. Once Rickett and Zimmerman and Janet had arrived in the helicopter, Mac and his family started to use their powers to bring Eric back to life. After saving Eric from a blazing fire, Mac and his family has granted citizenship at the Los Angeles City Hall, where Cruz's family, as well as their neighbors and the two FBI agents in attendance, you know, to grant it with a ceremony. You know, Max Fodder started to drive away in a pink Cadillac with his family along with the kids who had helped him while Mac, who was chewing bubble gum, had blow a bubble which suddenly in a superimposed animated style that sort of borrowed from ABC's Schoolhouse Rock, it reads a message, you're going to love this, we'll be back. Yeah, they were going to plan on making a sequel to this movie after this. Unfortunately, since this movie became a box office bomb, it never happened. But I believe this was the film that pretty much would have caused Orion Pictures to go through bankruptcy problems. Because they haven't been doing so well you know, during the late 80s, early 90s, as the company was going by. Yep, and I'm not surprised because this movie... It's a fucking insult to my intelligence. I mean, seriously. This movie had beautiful cinematography, a perfect location that they had, since it's all set in the suburban town in, of Palmdale. And I've been to Palmdale, by the way. It's actually a beautiful place. A lot of great houses over there. In fact, my aunt now lives there you know, with, with her family everywhere really cool they had a nice they actually has a nice place over there. it was cool yeah in fact we're also uh, planning on moving to another area pretty soon but I don't know when but someday we, we might but other than that though I this movie fucking sucks I, there's no doubt about it you know I, I love E.T. so much that I, I felt really cheated having to see this mess uh, everything was just done in a fucking poorly way. They knew they they plagiarized everything that this movie was going for. Um, There's even one scene where Debbie tries to say the word where, you know, they're trying to believe in Eric's story since they both spotted the same creature. Uh, you're gonna love this. She actually says, "Schizophrenia, 
Yeah, she's trying to say schizophrenia. Oh, brother. And, uh, the whole movie, um, yeah, the dance sequences I had mentioned before is, is silly. Yeah, it's, I feel like it's been borrowed by, by any other. The movie plays like a commercial, as it seems. Not to mention how disappointing it was to see Ronald McDonald in a cameo appearance, which he only didn't talk much. He, he just says, how you doing? And all that. It must have sucked. You know, having to deal with that when you're a little kid. And having to see this movie. The whole chase sequences were dumb. Yeah. You know, they're all crashing around and everything. They're already tripping and everything. <laughs> they, they really did totally rip this movie up to pieces. The uh, whole thing was just a joke. I mean, the cast, on the other hand, I mean... Okay, I, I do gotta admit though, the cast wasn't that bad. I know they went on to do a lot of films, well, not many people though, but... Christine Apostol, of course, had a career, but... She's been in some... Not so great films, as far as I'm concerned, but... And, and I know Jonathan Ward went on to do the voice of Ferngully, but... I don't think he hasn't done anything much since. Maybe some other... Um, TV movies or something like that. Although Steel, Steel Magnolias was another film he was in also, so I forgot to mention. But this film was just uh, too much. Uh, there was, um, it did have some good special effects as far as is concerned. That's, I mean, at least for that matter. But the alien creatures that they had in this film were, were poorly done. They look very ugly as they turn out, with the huge glowing eyes. Yeah, they, they almost look like they have Down Syndrome. And that's an insult to people who have Down Syndrome out there. Yeah. And, and of course, they, they wound up getting cured by Coca-Cola, Skittles, and all this other stuff. That plays exactly like Reese's Pieces, and that's... Oh, brother. There, there is nothing to like in, in this movie. It's just too much. Waste of time. What's the point? Thanks a lot, producers, who made this piece of shit film. Now I'm already hungry for McDonald's already. You know, having a Big Mac with fries and Coke. You know, just to calm me down or something. I don't know. Well... It's no wonder because it's one of the worst movies of 1988. And I believe it's already voted for the Ratsies for worst new star and worst director. Yeah, no doubt it. But it did have a good soundtrack though, I, I would believe. I mean, other than the Alan Silvestri score, they had some great songs such as Take Me, I'll Follow You, or Down to Earth, and those, those songs, this is amazing, it's, it's not worth it, um, I say avoid this film, if you must, well, I'm going to say this though, Mac and Me may not be the only film that's already ripping off E.T., the extraterrestrial, in fact, this year we now have a movie that's a found footage film called Earth to Echo, and it definitely rips off everything that E.T., The Extraterrestrial, and all these other films had to offer. In fact, I'm going to review that film later on, yeah, because I have yet to watch that. So I give Mac and Me zero stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora. I'm hungry for a Big Mac already. Bye.